Hey guys, Phil from Trail Talk here, and this week we're going to be designing what I consider to be my perfect dream bike. So I often get asked with my buyers guys and reviewing all these bikes, what would I consider to be my dream bike? What would the geometry be? What would the suspension platform I'd use? How much travel? So let's jump in and find out. So let's start with figuring out what bike I actually need. So I ride mostly blue and black trails. I typically ride just for my descent, so I climb up to the top just for a descent on the way down, not too much undulating terrain, but I definitely still like to have a bit more fun on the trail. I'm not the best rider either, so I don't need something with a ridiculous amount of travel either. So for me personally, out of all the bikes that I've tried, 140mm travel 29er with 150mm fork up front definitely does that job perfectly, so that's what we're going to go with. When it comes to the geometry of the bike, I want something that's decently modern but not over the top, so I don't want any of these super long bikes that are going to detract from the versatility and also the fun of the bike. I want it to be pretty easy and intuitive to ride and on those tight technical stuff, I don't want it to be too much of a bus either. So I want something that's nice and modern but not too long either. When it comes to the frame material, I'm going to stick with alloy. I know a lot of you would probably go carbon for the weight savings, also the ride fill as well, but I'm pretty happy with alloy frames and I don't want to have to worry if I crack the frame or also something's rubbing on the frame either. Alloy is just simple and it just works, so we're going to go with an alloy frame. Then a few other small things as well, we want a threaded BB, nice and easy, everyone's always happy with a threaded BB. Then we want a super boost rear end, no just kidding, get that super boost out of here, just a normal boost rear end will do the job perfectly. So now we have a bit of a foundation, let's decide what the frame actually looks like and the suspension platform that we will go with. Okay, so let's take a quick look at my favourite frames on the market at the moment and that way we can kind of gauge what we're really looking for. So starting with the Santa Cruz Hightower, I really like this frame. Just the low placement of the shop, the angles of the frame, I really like that kind of angular design as opposed to something that's more round. Yeah, it just really does it for me. So yeah, that's probably my favourite looking frame on the market at the moment. Then moving on to the Deviat Guide, I really like the geometry of this bike and then it uses my favourite suspension platform. So it's got that high single pivot on there and that's definitely what I'm looking for when I'm designing my frame. So if we combine these two frames together, what do we have? Pretty much a forbidden druid, yeah. <laughs> I really, really like this bike. Just the low shock placement, the angular look of the frame, it looks nice and aggressive. Yeah, it just really does it for me. So this is pretty much the frame design that I would go with if I was designing my own bike. So looking at the frame also, it has that high pivot, which I really like. So you've got that idler pulley there, and we'll go into that a bit later talking about the suspension platform. But as I said, I really like that low shock placement. And because of that, it really opens up the front triangle of the bike. And it looks like you could almost fit two water bottles in there, but if we can't, we'd probably lift that top tube up just ever so slightly so we can fit a bottle under the top tube. Then we'd move the one on the down tube a little bit further up. And then that way we can also fit a small accessory thing under that. So you'd have two water bottles as well as an accessory mount as well. So ride all day and then you've got your stuff on your bike if you have anything that goes wrong. Tool, tubes there. Yeah, it'd be absolutely awesome. Other than that, the only two other things that I changed would bump up the rear travel to 140 millimeters, and then we'd also tweak the geometry a little bit, which we'll go into later. So let's jump into the suspension platform now. So the real standout of this frame is the suspension, and if you really want to dig into the kinematics of the suspension, Trail POV did a good description of it, also did all the graphs and all that kind of stuff that you can look at too. So I'll put the link in the description to that video, definitely worth checking it out if you're really interested in the high pivot suspension platform as well as this bike as well. So as a lot of you know, I used to own a Craftworks and that bike had a high pivot on it as well. And on our rocky Sydney trails, the benefits really shined. So because of this rearward axle path, you've got a lot of chain growth and that means you'll see you've got a lot of any squats, so it's good for pedaling. But because you've got that big lot of chain growth there, you get a lot of pedal kickback. So when the suspension compresses, that kind of chain growth pulls on the chain ring and it causes your pedals to kick up, which isn't necessarily good. So when you route the chain around the idler pulley, it negates a lot of this force and you get virtually no pedal kickback, so that's awesome. So the rearward axle path also allows the rear wheel to get up and out of the way of obstacles on the trail. So if you've got square edge hits where a suspension goes up and a little bit forward, it gets hung up on a lot of things, but because it goes up and rearward, it's really getting out of the way of those square edge impacts and the suspension feels really supple and it kind of feels like it's propelling you down the trail instead of getting hung up on the small stuff. And as I said, it's got very high levels of anti-squat, so it's gonna pedal very, very well. So that's awesome as well. Now with most suspension platforms, they aren't necessarily perfect, and there's also a couple of drawbacks. And the main one with the high single pivot is there's a lot of anti-rise. 
So what this essentially means is the bike isn't very active under braking and when you're going through rougher sections of the trail when you're on the rear brake, you're gonna feel a thing called brake jack. However, some people prefer high levels of anti-rise because it means the bike stays very level and it preserves its geometry when you're going down steeper stuff on the brake. So there's definitely positives and negatives to this. I tend to sit in the middle, so I like a bit of both, but yeah. However, what we can do to tune the anti-rise is have a floating brake mount. So on the Eminent Cycles bikes, if you have a look at the photos here, they've got a floating brake mount. So that kind of separates the suspension from the braking performance so we can tune the anti-rise of the bike so we can really get it a bit more active under braking if we want. But other than that, the suspension platform is pretty much perfect. It's got plenty of progression if you look at those graphs on the Trail POV video, which is awesome. And it's gonna be nice and supple over the chunky stuff, get out of the way of all those square edge hits. It's gonna pedal amazingly because of that high levels of anti-squat and because of that progression as well, it's gonna have plenty of support there. Two, 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 two. It's gonna be an absolutely awesome bike and it's gonna be fun on the flowy stuff and absolutely eat up the chunk as well. And that's what you really want in a suspension platform. So let's get into the geometry of the bike. And as you guys know, I'm pretty picky when it comes to the geometry. And starting with the head angle, 65.5 degrees is definitely my sweet spot for a trail kind of all mountain bike. It feels good on climbs in a sense. Any slacker, it starts to feel a bit floppy on the climbs and you need to use a bit more body language. And when it's a bit slacker on the fun stuff, it's a bit harder to lift up the front end a bit more. So yeah, I feel like 65 and a half is that good balance between confidence while descending and have a bit of, having a bit of fun too. Unless the trails are very, very fast and open, I really don't feel a need going any slacker than this. It's kind of, again, detracting from that kind of fun aspect of the bike. And because I do have a descending priority, if it is a little bit steeper, then it starts to be a bit too nervous on that steep stuff. So yeah, as I said, 65.5 is that good balance for me. When it comes to the reach at 185 centimeters, so around six foot one, I like a 475 to 480 millimeter reach, and that's with a 630 mil stack, so you can kind of gauge that against bikes with similar stack, and then I like a 45 or a 50 millimeter stem. But again, that's just personal preference for me. You guys might like something different. So again, let me know in the comments what you guys like. But I feel like in combination with that 65 and a half degree head angle, it keeps that front center in check so it's not too long. So on flatter corners where I need to weight the front end a bit more, it's not too hard. And again, when I wanna have fun, that front center is not too long that it takes too much body language to lift up the front wheel and to get it to do what I wanna do. And again, just generally have fun on the bike. So for seat angle, I keep seeing them get steeper and steeper, but for me, my happy spot is around 76 degrees. But 76 for me, I'm in a pretty optimal position getting close over the cranks and I don't need to feel like I scooch forward a bit more in the saddle. And then again, on the flatter stuff, the 76 feels pretty normal. If I'm on a bike with 78 degrees or something like that, the bike starts to feel a bit weird and I feel like I'm over the cranks too much when I'm pedaling on the flat stuff. So I feel like 76 is that good balance. And again, all this stuff's in proportion. You've got to think about all these things tied together. So you see the angry reach in your effective top tube. I know a lot of people don't think of effective top tube as an effective measurement these days. That's not that good, but you're going to be seated pedaling a lot of the time. So I feel like your effective top tube is a decent measurement to have. So I prefer a 630 effective top tube. And with the 76 degree seat angle and that 480 millimeter reach, which I like, that gives me kind of around about that 630 effective top tube. So again, all in proportion, and that's what I like on my bike. So onto the chainstay now, and I want a 425 millimeter chainstay. I know a lot of you will think that's very short, but it's kind of on purpose. You've got that rearward axle path. So throughout the travel, it's gonna grow around 25 millimeters. So at SAG at around 30%, it's gonna be 432 millimeters around there and then at bottom out, it's gonna be at 450. So as you go faster and deeper into the travel, the bike's gonna feel a bit more stable. And then lastly, one around about a 450 millimeter seat tube so I can fit a nice long dropper in there. And it's not too short either that you've got a ridiculous amount of dropper exposed because I don't like a super, super long dropper. Something around about a 170 is perfect for me. I don't need a 210 or anything like that. So around 450 is perfect for me. So now for the last little details, one all internal cable routing except for the rear brake, again, just makes maintenance easy for that. That's to be some nice protection everywhere, so anywhere that the chain can come in contact with the frame, getting those nice ribbed protection strips there, and then also a pad under the down tube at the base, as well as a nice little shuttle pad, so if we go shuttling, then there's a nice bit of protection there as well. And the last thing that I really did consider was going in gearbox. So gearboxes, again, offers heaps amount of range, that weight's nice and low on the bike, but for a trail bike, I just wanted that weight low. I know I said I had an LA frame, so not really considering weight there, but 
for a trail bike, I just want it nice and simple. And then also, I know their maintenance is a lot better for a gearbox, so they're a lot more reliable. However, if something does go wrong, and I'm in the middle of nowhere, there's not really anywhere that I can buy a gearbox easy or get it fixed easy. So having that derailleur and cassette does make it a little easier in that sense. But yeah, it was something that I really did think about and I would like a gearbox, but if until they're widely avail available, then I would go a gearbox. But yeah, at the moment, still go the cassette and derailleur. So there you go, there's my dream bike, 140 millimeter travel, 29er with a high pivot suspension platform with some decently modern geo that's definitely not over the top. But I'd like to know what you guys think. Is this pretty close to what you consider to be your dream bike? But let us know what's your dream bike on the market as well. And if you've designed your own dream bike, let me know in the comments as well. It'd be awesome to see what you guys think to be your dream bike as well. In part two of this series, we'll spec out this bad boy and I'll let you guys know what my dream spec bike would be. And if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to give a like. Also subscribe to the channel. And as I said, yeah, comment down below. It'd be interesting to see what your dream bike's like as well. And as always guys, thanks for watching. See ya.